coming out today, all of you, to worship our Savior. I thank those of you particularly involved in the worship team and for Natasha singing to the glory of Christ. It's uh, one of those voices sculpted by God to paint pictures of faith when you sing. So I thank you. Christ has been and continues to be honored in this service. We are very thankful for the privilege to worship in peace. We want to remember those of us who are serving. Uh, Pastor Joe and his family are now up at Cross Lake. Pray for them. Joe's preaching. Sarah is over at Fish Lake, Ministry of Music. Pray for Sarah. We're thankful to have Pastor Joel back, Michelle, the children. And ministry without Pastor Joel is like running with one shoe off. So we thank God for Pastor Phil being willing to read today. And we thank you all for your participation in prayer. This is the battle prayer. And so grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, as Phil pointed out, the chapter 14 of the book of Mark, verses 10 and 11, two verses sandwiched between the anointing at Bethany and then the Passover narrative. Um, this is a a mighty passage today speaking to the heart of a betrayer. A betrayal is the act of aiding an enemy. The act of aiding an enemy. It can involve deception, desertion, and so on, but what it is, one way of looking at it is pride on fire. Just betrayal is, is that. And so we're, we see this in the heart of Judas Iscariot and from the, by the Holy Spirit through the pen of Mark, it comes to the parchment, to the people in Rome first and then to the church age beyond that. This is these are two little verses that speak volumes to the heart of betrayal and the church needed to know it in the first century and we need to know it today as we pray for one another and look to the future in Christ Jesus. So, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yesterday, when Joe and I met um, uh, for coffee, and I was fashionably late so he could buy the coffee, we were talking about James 4, and we'll be preaching on that today up at Cross Lake, probably doing that right now. And we were talking about how important it is to put your trust in Jesus Christ, to hold fast to Him, and to think of what God wants and not what we want. To think about what Christ would have us do and never to betray the Lord no matter what our circumstances might be. So let's pray and ask God to help us to hear, help me to say, for all of us to hear to the glory of Christ. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who is King over every nation, 
every people group, every tribe, every language, He is Lord. And He demands from us absolute commitment. He demands from us, as the people of God, to desire Him above even our lives. Lord God Almighty, put down the pride that dwells within us and lift up the heart of a servant and give to us a passion for the majestic, a desire to know God more and more and to be willing to be diminished more and more for the sake of Jesus Christ in the holy name of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, we pray. Here is one of the most famous stories of betrayal. Gaius Julius Caesar was a Roman general, and you may have read about Gaius Julius Caesar in your history books, although now he's probably being edited out for uh, someone else. Gaius Julius Caesar was a Roman general. He was a statesman and a consul, and a, he was dictator in perpetuity. In perpetuity, he was dictator, like someone else today I'm thinking of. He built a bridge across the Rhine River. The Romans were very adept at building and in uh, military engineering and so he was one of the first generals to, to build a successful bridge across the Rhine and he captured Gaul for the Roman Empire he uh, conducted the first invasion of Britain hence his little accent on March 15 44 BC what happened on March 15th 44 BC. The Ides of March, beware. 23 stabs later, Julius Caesar was lying on the floor of the Senate, or at least the entrance into the Senate, having been betrayed by a group of rebellious senators who were led by a, mar a man by the name of Marcus Junius Brutus, and there wasn't a hamburger in sight. Marcus Junius, or if you're a uh, purist, Junius, Marcus Junius Brutus. And after that, after he died, there was a series of civil wars. Remember the account of Mark Antony. And Caesar's adopted heir ultimately took the throne, Octavius, who was later known as Augustus. Augustus Caesar, who was the emperor when our Lord, the true emperor, the true peace, was born. Augustus, although he was famous for the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was certainly and infinitely overcome by the peace of Christ. That is, that, uh, that uh, accomplishment in which he so boasted. The peace of Christ infinitely surpassing the peace of this age. About 19 years after the death of Augustus, another and infinitely more important betrayal took place, and that was the betrayal of Jesus Christ by Judas Iscariot. From this betrayal initially recorded by Mark for the church at Rome, we can learn certain and vital truths about the spirit or attitude of the betrayer. Julius Caesar had them all around him, and uh, he no doubt had some information 
Mark Antony was going to warn him but was delayed and didn't get to the Senate in time and uh, Julius Caesar was taken down. Jesus knew absolutely. He knew that Judas Iscariot was the son of perdition. And Judas Iscariot would be the betrayer of all betrayers. And his example is for us today to learn and to grow as we enter in to a moment in history, I believe in this culture, which is a moment of betrayal. Betrayers will be in and around the church until the kingdom is finally restored. The question for us today from these two little verses, 10 and 11, what are the qualities or the characteristics of a betrayer? Judas is in the foreground, and the general definition is one who aids an enemy against a friend. But a betrayer is more than that. We'll walk through quickly the four characteristics in the time remaining, and we will then apply a couple of applications, and then we will move to our time of Sunday school or Sunday or adult education, youth education, total education. Today in the chapter we'll be going over 1 John, 1 John, chapter 2, 7 through 14, and it will relate to this passage. So what are the qualities of a, of a betrayer? Someone who, who aids an enemy against a friend or even takes down the friend? A betrayer is four qualities. We will look at them carefully. Verse 10, the first one, is a betrayer is close. C-L-O-S-E. A betrayer is close. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, pause. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He was one of the twelve who shared in the preaching, in the teaching, observed the miracles of Christ. He sat at meal with the Son of Man, walked along with him, saw him still the storm, Oof. raging storm going on. Jesus says, peace be still. And the Greek is clear. The waves go from this height to sheet of glass in an instant. And the disciples are petrified. Why? Because a little glimpse of holiness of God was presented terrified they were he saw all of this and yet was willing to betray the Savior very close those who betray are not strangers to the one betrayed they are very very close I remember many years ago serving in the capacity as an engineer and working in an office setting in a situation where we had a team working on various projects my supervisor a decent chap had a boss over him and one day the boss over my supervisor called me in in a rather odd time to have a discussion with me about my boss and my boss wasn't really cutting it, was physically becoming physically more and more incapable. And the intimation was that maybe I could take his position. Well, <laughs> what do I look like? A rube? Are you kidding me? So I sat there and listened to him and listened and uh, I forget the exact words as I'm breaking material up here. I forget the exact words, but something like, uh, I don't know why you called me in here, but I'm not going to have anything to do with this. In fact, I'm going right now to tell my boss what you said. How's that? Well, that's the end of promotion for me. So I went and told him, and he then took a course of action to be very careful what he did around this gentleman. It was a corporate setting, not a church. But in my heart I realized this gentleman 
was trying to destroy another one to betray him on the same team seeking to betray him the former tried to get me on his side but only by the grace of God as a young Christian I refused and moved on it's not a story about how great I am it's a story about how great God is to take a weak sinner and they enable me to say no at a moment when it could easily have could have easily gone the other way. Betrayers are often very close. They can appear in families. Situations where young people are betrayed by activities of older. Now this isn't a call to paranoia, but it's a call to prayer. Close up. Close up, right around you around us we have our friends our family and so on church settings across the nation you have betrayers and they're like judas and they're very close that's the first quality of a betrayer the second quality is a betrayer is deliberate notice this then judas iscariot who was one of the twelve went to the chief priests and the scribes and other members of the Sanhedrin in order to betray him to them. This is deliberate action. The word in order to, this word hina, this Greek word, this word speaks of purpose. So Judas went. He purposed to go to the Sanhedrin with the very purpose in mind to betray Jesus to them, to turn him in. He went to the enemies of Christ to turn him in. Notice chapter 14, verse 1 and verse 2. That was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, that being Jesus, by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Judas now acts by the providence of God. So he deliberately, or after careful thinking, you might say, Judas goes to the enemies of Christ. He took the initiative to do so. Nobody was twisting his arm. He deliberately sought to turn over Christ for the purpose of having him killed. There is a movement today among liberal scholars to vindicate Judas, to say that Judas was a victim of circumstance. Really, he wasn't all that bad of a guy. He was just, uh, I don't know what you put it, he was just a, a deranged accountant. And uh, he didn't have much, much, much chance, you know, against all of these forces around him. In fact, he was probably forced into it by the forces around him. What nonsense. He took the initiative to destroy. According to the word of God, he acted deliberately. The creator of all things, the Lamb of God, the King of glory, he sought to have him killed. That is deliberate action. Every betrayal in the history of this fallen world has involved this quality, deliberate action. Consider this. In our context, it is a dangerous thing and yet it goes on in offices, in homes, churches, you name it, across this nation and around the world. It is a dangerous thing to deliberately harm an innocent. And yet, it happens. And quite often. If you notice it in the church context, this is something that is most egregious. The deliberate undermining of Christ 
still goes on, not only by liberal theology, but by the assaults upon the under shepherds and the assaults in homes goes on. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. And the question that must be asked of those who deliberately behave as Judas, don't you fear God? There is a third quality that Judas displayed. Look at verse 11. There are two more. The first two being a betrayer is close and a betrayer is deliberate. A betrayer is also dark. Dark. Verse 11. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. When they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he goes, as I said before, to those who hated Jesus. And here's the reason why he went to those who hated Jesus. Because he hated him too. He was no victim. He hated him. He hated Christ. Can you imagine? Oh no, he was a victim of a circumstance. Nonsense. Why was Judas behaving as such? Perhaps it was jealousy, maybe frustration. Jesus just wasn't doing what he wanted him to do. Listen, Lord, you're supposed to boot out the Romans. You're supposed to get rid of this, the rule of Augustus here. For us, we don't want it. We want to get back to, you know, to our own independence. We don't want Rome hanging around. Why don't you take care of them? Or... What are you doing wasting all this good on ointment? You know, this is, what are you talking about? This whole year's wage for an average worker. And you're wasting it in one fell swoop. What's wrong with you? You're just not doing things the way I want you to. So in return, for the love of Jesus, he brought hatred to the table. He hated Jesus just as much as the others. Did. They were glad. Why were they glad? Because their objectives matched. Desire for death, hatred, you name it. And he received, as we know from another context, 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver for, for the Lord. My goodness. the creator of the whole universe, the king of kings, the guy who still storms and feeds people out of a pittance, thousands of people, 5,000 in one shot, 4,000 in another, that's just the man. You add up the, all, all the women and children, and thousands and thousands of people. He did all that, but Judas hated him. I cannot understand at one level I can, but another I can't. Why would people operating within the church say things that, like this, Christ isn't God? Or Christ, you know, had a relationship with one of the other disciples, as we're hearing out there in the, in the um, leftist theological circle. Uh, all of these horrible things about Christ. That's betrayal. And it still goes on. It's so serious, this dark attitude toward Christ. Look at John 15, 23. John 15, 23. In the book of John, in the, in the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 18, we'll, we'll sidle into verse 23. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because 
they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Verse 23, whoever hates me hates my father also. Wow. There's no victim here. It's absolutely serious. Deadly serious. The betrayer is dark. Because the betrayer of truth actually hates Christ. The hatred of truth is on the rise in the Western church. Hatred of those who preach the truth and teach it is also on the rise because if they're true, then they'll represent Jesus. So they're hated. But more than that, and that's enough, but those who will so live also hate the Father. Oh my, Judas Iscariot, close in. Judas Iscariot, so close to Jesus, they ate together, they walked together, they talked together, and yet, ultimately, he hated him. Judas hated Jesus. He sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. That's it? That's it? For the king of glory? And the last one is found in a word. So far, the qualities of a betrayer are, ah, betrayer is close in, deliberate and dark. And one other related to the former. Number three is the betrayer is selfish. This is Mr. or Mrs. or Miss Selfie on steroids. This is the selfishness. Notice what it says. And he, Judas, sought. Sought, it's an action, an opportunity to betray him. Some translations say opportune time, sought an opportune time. A very good translation is a convenient moment. Now, if you're going to do something that's convenient, what does that mean? You're doing it for yourself. Well, I'm going to wait till it's convenient to me. Then I'm going to take my action. Wow. This guy knows how to be selfish. By the way, so do I. That's why I need to know this. And I need to know power of the Holy Spirit to forgive. The text tells us that Jews, Judas went about his evil work at his own convenience and for his own benefit. 30 pieces of silver. Note Paul's words with respect to a similar matter. What kind of betrayers have in common this selfishness? They have a worldishness. And uh, look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. Paul runs into this. Do your best to come to me soon. Verse 10. For Demas, I don't, I, do you ever run into somebody named Demas? I mean, I don't think a Christian a couple would sit down. Let me see. Harold, you know. Oh, over here, Sally Joe, whatever. How about Demas? Yeah, you know, that'd be a great one. Let's let's name the son here Demas. That'll be fun. No, I don't think so. That's not gonna happen. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Ooh. Notice how Paul writes that. In love with this present world. And the word there means he is passion. His treasure is the world. And so he deserts Paul. Judas, in this extreme sense, betrays the Savior in love with the world. In love with its power. Probably seeking the right one with whom to associate. So... 
that Rome would come tumbling down. Many people, perhaps many people would have agreed with him. Let's bring it down now. Selfish people love the world and not the father and his son. Selfish people betray the truth. And they do things for their own benefit. The betrayer is one who is all for himself. They want to destroy in order to get something. That is the heart of a betrayer. We're almost out. Here it is. What are the qualities of a betrayer? A betrayer, through the example of Judas, is a close, is close, deliberate, dark, and selfish. Know this, American church. Know this, church worldwide. We know from testimonies of people living under persecution. And Nip, Nick Ripkin, associated with the uh, Southern Baptist Convention, I remember I quoted him. By the way, that's not his real name. <laughs> He ministers in Muslim countries, and if he did give his name, he'd probably be taken out. But he is, that's his pen name. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he wrote and said, hey, 80% of all those who truly profess, uh, profess Christ around the world live under persecution. So normal living is living under persecution. We're living abnormally right now. And... Uh, <clears throat> But for those who live under persecution, they tell us, many testimonies tell us that you have to be careful with whom you share the faith and the person may embrace it immediately. And then you come to realize they're a betrayer. They'll just turn you in. So you have to prayerfully go about your business, carefully trusting in Jesus Christ every moment, sharing your faith. Those are the qualities of the betrayer. Let me give you a couple of quick applications and then we'll close in prayer. The church must pray. This is number one, the application. You must pray for discernment because betrayers are not easily recognized. John 13, 21 through 30. When Jesus was interacting with Judas at that last supper, before Jesus, Judas went out into the night. Those are the words that John used. Went out into the night. Darkened. The other disciples, before he, and they were interacting and then ultimately he left, the other disciples didn't get it. Why? Because Judas was part of their team. He didn't have a sign on him that said, Betrayer. Or JB, Judas, the betrayer. Uh uh. Hard to tell. They are close and yet so far removed from Christ. They pretend to honor the truth of Christ at the same time seek to discredit the truth in anyone who would proclaim it. That is what their, jo their job is. And they're in the broad church today. They're in the culture. They're even in homes. There are other forms of betrayal, number two, that can affect believers' lives. Believers can be subject to ver verbal, physical, many kinds of abuse, adultery, theft, and so on. Those forms of betrayal that go on often and leave people damaged. Those who were supposed to help the innocent sometimes end up harming them. They are betrayers of trust. To the betrayed as such... Seek help from word and prayer and those who love. To those who have been betrayed, you know the sting of having your life harmed. But know that there is mercy and there is grace and restoration through Jesus Christ who faced the betrayal and the torture of the cross for the sake of his people. To those who betray and have betrayed, if you have confessed and repented your sin and have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, you have a great thing. If there are betrayers who need restoration, seek hard after God and find rest. 
Know also that there is betrayal, an ongoing betrayal, when one denies the truth of Christ and hates Him by not worshiping Him. There is an end like Judas in store. So, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if there is anyone who is aligning with the betrayer today, who is walking with Judas rather than Christ, the challenge is to repent and trust in Jesus. The one who went to the cross, suffered, died, rose, ascended, and is coming again. By the power of the Holy Spirit, flee to Jesus, even this moment. And we'll turn now to prayer. Heavenly Father, in the glorious name of Jesus, we thank you for the cross. The betrayal was indeed a part of the redemptive account, the redemptive purposes of God. It had to happen, it did happen. And along the way, it also gives us a picture as the church. It gives us a picture of what is out there and what is around us. Let us not be paranoid, let us be prayerful. Show us, Lord, that which is going on so that we might respond well. And look into our own hearts, O oh Lord, and show our own hearts. Where do we sometimes act like the betrayer? Forgive us, Lord. Cause us as believers to flee to you, to seek the restorative mercy that we need. Perhaps we have betrayed many a friend. Perhaps we have betrayed family members. Perhaps we have betrayed, uh, the list goes on. And we have recognized ourselves in some sense here in this passage regarding Judas. Lord God is professing believers, help us, forgive us, change us. May we live more and more for Christ and less and less for the world. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our resurrected Savior.